I'm Carol Burkhalder, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Carol. Hey. Um, let's see. Well, I have I had two parents who were both alcoholics, um, but I was never going to be like them. And so, um, went to college at St. Louis University. My main goal was to get married and have children, and so I did that. And I was married uh, 14 years and had three children. And then in 1978, I got divorced. And uh, I'm the oldest of five children, and there are four of us left now. One died of lung cancer. Um, but I'm the oldest, so I was always the one who knew what to do. You know, the one in control, the one who everyone depended on, the, the responsible one. So um, after I got divorced, little known to me, I couldn't handle the feelings and I couldn't handle my three kids. And I had started drinking uh, during my marriage like while I was cooking dinner and stuff like that. But I didn't really uh, notice that it was getting out of control. And so after I got divorced, um, I decided I lived in a small town in southern Indiana at the time, Dale, Indiana. And uh, I had to get out of there. But I couldn't do that with three kids. So when my kids were visiting their father for the summer, I just decided to move. And also, I should tell you that I, by that time, I was working in a bar. I was a cocktail waitress. Uh, I always wanted to do that, but my husband would never let me do it. And so after I got divorced, I did it. And then I drank there on my days off, you know. And uh, and I picked up people there too, men there. I was always a bar drinker. Um, I'm too much of a people person to stay home by myself and drink. I have to be with other people. And also my self-esteem was so bad in those days uh, that I, I needed the strokes I got, especially from men in bars. Anyway, um, so after about, I, I ended up moving. I rented a 42-foot U-Haul truck and drove it myself from southern Indiana to St. Louis. And my sister followed me in my little Chevette. And uh, so we got to St. Louis. And so when I got to St. Louis, I moved in with a woman I know who lived in St. Louis, and she was divorced by this time. Her husband had cheated on her, so we had a lot to talk about. Anyway, um, I thought she didn't drink. She wasn't a drinker. So during that time I lived with her, I didn't drink. Uh, however, as soon as I got my own place right after that, I started going out to the bars and drinking again, you know, as I did when I was in southern Indiana. Um, the way I look at it, I was when I was meditating today, it came to me that I was fearless and I was filled with fear. <laughs> I was fearless because I would go anywhere to any horrible bar. I would pick up any people, doesn't matter how low, you know, they were lower companions, obviously, it didn't matter. You know, I would do anything. Um, but I didn't know that I had a lot of fear in me, too. I didn't know that until I got into recovery and found out how much fear I did had and did have and how much I was trying to cover it up with my behavior. So 
<clears throat> anyway, this drinking thing went on for about three years, I think. And um, my friends kept saying to me, Carol, everyone gets upset when they get divorced and they go out and drink, you know, for a little while, but don't you think it's time to stop the drinking? <laughs> and I said, well, no, I don't think so, not yet, you know. But anyway, by that time, I had a sister who was already in the program in a different city. And so I asked her, I knew my life was out of control. I got a job eventually in St. Louis, and, and it was a really good job. It was at HOK Architects, who I had always wanted to work for. So um, that was really good. But, you know, I was doing things like staying out so late at night, you know, and coming in in crumpled clothes to my job and everything, and just looking like I hadn't slept, you know, because who knows what I, what I was doing, you know, the night before. But anyway, so I asked my sister, I said, you know, my life seems a little out of control. I'm not exactly sure what I should do about it. And she said, because, see, my outside still looked okay. And I could always convince anyone that I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Even when I couldn't drive my car, I could convince anyone, yeah, I can drive my car, I'm fine. Until the time in southern Indiana when I almost went off the road into a, a, a cow field, you know, and fishtailed it and then got sober in about two seconds. You know? <laughs> but anyway, um, so my sister said, why don't you just go to a meeting and tell them exactly how you feel and what you're telling me and see what they say. So the meeting I went to was on um, Ballas and Manchester at St. Paul's Church, and it was um, a it was a bridge meeting of AA and Al-Anon. And the night I went, it was Al-Anon. So all the Al-Anon people <laughs> knew what I was like, and knew how much I drank, and knew that I didn't have any money because I drank up all my money, and knew that I woke up in the night with all these fears and blah, blah, blah. And so those that wasn't really how I was. So I had to go out and drink some more in order to prove them wrong. And also, there was another woman at that meeting that kind of felt the same way I did. So of course we got together after the meeting and talked about how wrong they were and how you know, we were right and they were wrong. So, but anyway, so my life kept getting more and more miserable, mostly because I felt so miserable and I felt so bad about the things I was doing and the way I was acting. And so I went to a different meeting. I went to Central Services. It was on um, 7 p.m. on a Sunday night and all the people in that meeting were laughing and hugging each other and talking about God, which I didn't really get into but at that time. But anyway, they were all they seemed very happy. So the thing is I wanted what they had. So I stuck around. And then um that was the beginning of my recovery. And then I came to the Lindell Club and I knew that I would have to get into a women's meeting because that would be the way I would be the most honest would be to be in a women's meeting. And so I got into group 18 on Monday night. That was my home group. And um, after I had 30 days sober, I had a sponsor. First I had a temporary sponsor, and then eventually I got a permanent sponsor. And so my permanent sponsor, when I had 30 days, 
said to me, well, then you can speak at this meeting. You have 30 days. That's all you need is 30 days. I was totally freaked out. 30 days sober, and I have to tell my story to the group. So I did it. I did it. And then afterwards, a whole lot of the women were saying, we heard all the pain in your story. But, you know, maybe they heard it. I, I didn't feel it. I couldn't feel it at that time. Because I seem to have this memory. I have kind of a selective memory. Maybe it's from my... Um, when I grew up with my parents getting drunk all the time and fighting, I learned to shut off my memory of things and not remember them. And so so that's what I did. So that that's probably why I couldn't feel my pain either because I wasn't willing to. You know, I had to put it off on a shelf somewhere, but I couldn't feel it until I was ready and then I could feel it. So I went to this women's meeting I also knew I didn't have any kind of self-discipline in my life. And the first discipline I had was reading the 24 hours a day book, meditation book, every single day. Because prior to that, no discipline, no structure, nothing. Because my parents weren't too good at you know, setting limits for me, anything like that, so they didn't. I mean, I was, I excelled in school, and I did very well in school, and because that's where I got my um, strokes for, for doing good things. Anyway, but, um, so I did, read the 24-hour book every day. I also knew that I would probably never read the big book. Um, you know, it would be nice to think that I would, and I still do this sometimes. I think it would be nice if I would read such and such a book, but then I know I won't. And I and I really know myself much better now than I did then. But anyway, so I had to get into a big book study group that would force me to read the book. So that's what I did. And I didn't really get what doing the steps meant. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out doing the steps. What do you? What does doing them mean? What does that mean? <laughs> so, I just repeated them over and over to myself, and also, of course, I did my fourth step with another woman in my group. I didn't do it with my sponsor because I didn't want to. I did it with another woman in my group, and she was very. She was really well. Also, I always picked people who were very gentle with me, who would not be like the big book thumper type, you know, not be like, you have to call me every day, and if you don't, you know, you're not going to stay sober. I can't deal with that. <laughs> so I always got the ones that were easy on me, you know, and that was good for me. And also that turns out to be how I am with people that I sponsor. I'm pretty easy with them. But because you really have to want it yourself. So I was doing all the things that I was supposed to. Um, meanwhile, my children, you know, since I had left and just left them with their father, I can't remember if he was living in Minneapolis or Kansas City, but one of those places. And I said, when I get back on my feet after I recover, I'll, get, I'll want the kids back. But meanwhile, he got tired of waiting because I never, never did ask for them back. It wasn't a very long time. But anyway, then he wanted me to pay him child support. So I had to pay him 100 bucks a month. So, um, however, I, my kids... Uh, when I got divorced, they were like 8, 10, and 12. And then my son, who is the youngest one, always wanted to come back and live with me. But I was always afraid I wouldn't have enough money. So there's the fear, the fear. And my second daughter 
also wanted to come back and live with me. Uh, so what ended up was those two came back and lived with me when I was in recovery. And that was great because I got to really bond with my second daughter. My oldest daughter by this time was in college. So I never really felt as close to her as I did to the other two. And then uh, my son is now like 43 years old. So he used, he actually used to work at the at this club sometimes during that time. So this was the place where I came to most of my meetings, but I also went to meetings all over the city because I said to myself, you went to bars all over the place. You weren't afraid of going to those bars. You can certainly go to the meetings. So I went to the meetings all over the place too. And um, that was turned out to be a really good experience for me. Um, I think willingness is the most important part in the beginning. You have to be willing and you have to, or you have to really want it. And I really wanted it. Because I saw what other people had and I saw how their lives were getting better. And my early recovery was not without problems. Um, well, it wasn't exactly early. The first, when I first came in the program was 1980. And I stayed sober five years. But then I smoked pot. Because <laughs> that was my uh, fallback, you know. Um, because they told me when I first came in, you can't smoke pot either. And I, intellectually, I bought it. But evidently, it wasn't in my heart, you know. And also, I was dating a guy who smoked pot, you know, not going to meetings, not talking to my sponsor, all the things that are bad. So uh, now my dry date is from that time, May 21st, 1985. That is from nada, nothing, no alcohol, no drugs. So that was great to do that. And also, um, that is the date of my second daughter's high school graduation. So I was going to Kansas City to her high school graduation, and there's a, a guy um, in that was pretty well known in AA, who I had encountered one time as he was a speaker at a meeting I went to. I had gone to college with this guy and gone out with him in college. And suddenly he's a speaker at an AA meeting. And so that was great. And he lived in Kansas City. And so he said, when you come to Kansas City, be sure to look me up and we'll have a cup of coffee. So. I did that at the time I went for my daughter's graduation. He picked me up, I jumped in his car, and I said, I smoke pot, but that doesn't count, and I can still have two dry days. And he said, no, it doesn't. You have to get honest, and you have to start all over. <laughs> and I said, and he was like a big book thumper guy. I said, okay. So I did that, except when I started over, I made sure I went to meetings where no one knew me. <laughs> because I, my pride, I was so proud of having five years or whatever it was, you know, at that time. And I couldn't admit it in front of the people who knew me. But whatever it takes, you know. So that from that date, I started over. And and then I have also started over with renewing my program and doing my program from the beginning, you know, because you can do it over and over every day, you know. And so the, doing the old, the um, not the old timers, the base, back to basics meeting has really been good for me, chairing that, because it has helped me to refresh my um, program. And right now, I was sponsoring two women. Um, however, one of them 
never could come here. This is about the only place I ever saw her, and she can't ever come here, so I guess I'm not sponsoring her anymore, you know, because we don't talk. The other one that I was sponsoring went to some kind of AA boot camp thing that's in Branson or someplace. I don't know if any of you know of that. And she's still there. So she used to text me and send me um, emails, but I haven't heard from her lately either. So at the moment, I'm not sponsoring anyone. But it was really good for me to sponsor those two because for me, it even is, it does me more good than it does them to sponsor them because I have to hear myself saying what I think and facing it, you know, and, and thinking, is that right? Is that right? But anyway, um, the, the things that happened to me after I got sober were suddenly in around 1985, uh, I found out I had cataracts on my eyes, and there was no reason for me to have cataracts. I think I was, uh, at that time, in my 40s can't remember. But anyway, so they said I would have to have cataract surgery. So I was, talk about fear, I was like, oh my God, I can't drive my car. I won't be able to go anywhere. I'm going to be blind, blah, 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 all these fears, <laughs> all these horrible fears. See, that's what my mind does to me. It immediately goes to the worst possible scenario. It doesn't do that anymore, though. It's pretty, pretty modulated now. But at that time, it did. Well, anyway, I had the cataract surgery for both eyes, and the reason I still have glasses is because of my astigmatism, I think. I have a real bad astigmatism, but otherwise I, I'm, I can see, and everything's fine. And I can help other people who have to have it, too. They think it was probably something genetic, that maybe my father died at age 53, so we don't know if he could have had cataracts. So, anyway. Um, the other things were I lost like three jobs in a row, and when that happened to me, um, one of them I got fired from, another one I got laid off because there wasn't enough work, and I can't remember what the third one was. But anyway, I, I survived that by coming here every day and by telling myself, Carol, you still have a place to live, you still have your car, and you still have money to buy something to eat, you know. And then, of course, I got unemployment, and I went on many job interviews and all that, and eventually got another job. So, um, but the, re the way I got through it was from the people here, and going to the meetings here, in this room, and the women here and all those wonderful connections that I had made from the Lindo Club. So um, it's, it's my whole spiritual life, too, is my program, definitely, with my prayer and meditation. I was baptized Catholic many years ago, but have not practiced being a Catholic for many years because it never did anything for me. But my prayer and meditation with my program is works wonders for me. Um, let's see, what else can I tell about? It's it's definitely a day at a time because sometimes I get I still get fearful and I still get resentful of things. And uh, but as long as I keep going to meetings, I always hear someone say what I need to hear. And it's great, and I love it. And that right now, my home group is downtown at Lucas Park Grill on Washington Avenue, mm. the Fog Lifters group. It's wonderful. I love it. There's a lot of sobriety there, too. It's at 1030 on Saturday morning. And uh, I could walk there from where I live. I don't. I usually drive. But anyway, I live close enough to walk. So um, everything is pretty good. I met my husband in Al-Anon, and um, 
I wasn't sure if he was going to show up today, but he hasn't. And uh, uh, he's not in AA. He's in Al-Anon still. Well, he doesn't go to Al-Anon anymore. But anyway, so that's where I met him. And uh, he is the one who bought me my lifetime membership in the club which because he was really grateful because his wife before me was a drinking alcoholic so compared to that I'm like Miss Universe or mm. something <laughs> I used to say Miss America now I think Miss Universe so anyway um, I am so happy to be sober and I'm so happy that you're all here today and I hope that my story made sense to someone thanks a lot Thank you.